Up to now, we've been studying the functions of complex variables in the domain of their analyticity. The points of non-analyticity also deserve a special attention. And now we have all the tools to classify them. In complex analysis, there are several types of singularities, and those include isolated singularities, non-isolated singularities, and branch points. An isolated singularity of a function f of z is a point z0 such that there exists a punctured neighborhood of this point, modulus of z minus z0, smaller than r and greater than 0, such that the function is analytic inside this neighborhood and undefined at point z0. It turns out that all isolated singularities can be classified according to the appearance of the Laurent series in the corresponding punctured disk. Three possibilities of the corresponding Laurent series in the disk exist, and those correspond to three distinct types of isolated singularities. Type 1, by far the easiest one, when the Laurent series doesn't have negative powers at all. And it is written as f of z equals c0 plus c1 times z minus z0 and so on. Clearly it defines a function for which point z equals z0 is actually a point of analyticity. That is why this point is called a removable singularity. And the typical example would be a function f of z equals sine of z over z. Well, at first one might think that point z equals 0 is a point where the function is undefined. But if we accurately compute the limit as z tending to 0, we will immediately discover that the limit of the function is well defined, it's equal to 1. And if we set f of 0 to be equal to 1, we will recover the function which is fully analytic at point z equals 0. So this case is more or less clear. The second type of singularities. This is the case where the Laurent expansion has only a finite amount of terms with negative powers. So let's write it down c minus n over z minus z0 to the power of n plus c minus n plus 1 over the z minus z0 to the power of n minus 1, and so on. In this case, point z equals z0 is called the pole of the order n. The case n equals to 1 is termed a simple pole. And the typical example would be f of z equals 1 over sine cubed over z. Well, this function has a third order pole at point z equals pi n, where n is an arbitrary integer. And finally, the third case, when our function has a Laurent expansion with infinite amount of negative power terms. So we write f of z is equal to dots plus c negative 1 over z minus z naught plus c naught plus c1 z minus z naught plus and so on. In this case, z0 is called an essential singularity. And the typical example would be function f of z equals e to the power of 1 over z. If we build a Laurent expansion of this function in the vicinity of 0, we'll obtain the infinite amount of negative powers. Actually, the distinction between an essential singularity and a pole can be formulated in a different but equivalent way. If we have a pole z0, then function f of z has an infinite limit as z tends to z0. Well, for those of you who find the very concept of an infinite limit a little bit strange or unusual, you may think of it as, as equivalent to the case of 1 over f tending to 0 as z tends to z0. We'll elaborate more on the concept of infinite limits when we'll discuss them in the framework of a Riemann sphere. But the point of an essential singularity is such that the limit of the function at this point does not exist. Well, the non-existence of the limit is usually proved in the framework of a Heinen's definition of the limit. And the definition goes as follows. We say that the function f of z has limit m as z tends to z0 if for any sequence zn converging to z0 the sequence of the values of the function f of zn always converges to the same point m. Let's see how this works for our classical example, the exponential to the power of 1 over z. So z0 is equal to 0. Let's devise a sequence zn equals to 1 over 2 pi i n. 
as n tends to infinity, the n tends to zero. So that's fine. Then f of the n is equal to e to the power of 2 pi i n. So it's always equal to 1, and the corresponding limit is 1. Fine. Now let's try a different sequence. Say the n equals negative 1 over n. Well, as n tends to plus infinity, again, the n tends to 0. But f of the n will be equal to the exponential to the power of negative n. And it tends to 0 as n tends to plus infinity. And so we have two different limits. And that means that the limit does not exist. And we face an essential singularity. And some simple advice. When you deal with complex integrals, you always need to recognize an essential singularity when you encounter it. Here we discussed a classical example. We encounter an essential singularity whenever we have an exponential function in the infinite power. Well, believe it or not, such is the majority of cases. In most of the integrals you will encounter, the essential singularity will stem from that type of exponentials. So whenever we have an exponential raised to an infinite power, you always know that you're facing an essential singularity. Typical example can be function sine of 1 over z. Here z equals 0 would be an essential singularity. Why? Because sine is a combination of exponentials. And this way we complete our discussion of isolated singularities. Unfortunately, non-isolated singularities do not admit of such a nice classification. So instead of discussing them, let me give you some simple example of a non-isolated singularity. Let's consider a function f of z equals tangent of 1 over z. Well, as you remember, tangent is singular if its argument is equal to pi by 2 plus pi n, where n is an arbitrary integer. So this way, zn, which is equal to 1 over pi by 2 plus pi n, can be checked to be simple poles of this function. And now the statement, z equals 0 here, is a non-isolated singularity. Why? Because no matter how small we choose the neighborhood of z equals 0, we will always be able to find such a big n that the pole of the n will be positioned inside this neighborhood. And that precisely means that this point is a point of a non-isolated singularity. And now the branch points. Well, the branch points are usually accounted when we deal with multivalent functions. For example, square root of z or the logarithm of z. For these functions, z equals zero is a so-called branch point. We'll study them comprehensively in week four of our course. But for now, we'll just tell that to make your function single-valued, you always need to draw a cut in a complex plane, and this cut should always start at a branch point. We'll elaborate on this further in our future lectures. But for now, I think that's it, and good luck with your homework exercises.